We're at a moment when the international system is in a period of change like we haven't seen for several hundred years. Uh, in uh, some parts of the world, the nation state on which the existing international system was based is either uh, giving up its traditional aspects like in Europe or as in the Middle East. George H.W. George H. Bush would campaign for a new world order like no other president before him. He would openly discuss it during his State of the Union address. What is at stake is more than one small country. It is a big idea, a new world order, where diverse nations are drawn together in common cause to achieve the universal aspirations of mankind. Again, a unified Europe was a major goal in creating this order. With few exceptions, the world now stands as one. A year and a half ago, in Germany, I said that our goal was a Europe whole and free. Tonight, Germany is united. Europe has become whole and free. The world can therefore seize this opportunity to fulfill the long-held promise of a new world order. We can find meaning and reward by serving some higher purpose than ourselves. A shining purpose. The illumination of a thousand points of light. Bush Sr. and his administration would tour and promote this agenda across the board at any given opportunity. The president has spoken often of a new world order. And we have an unprecedented opportunity to build a new era of peace and prosperity here and abroad, to build a new world order it's my understanding, I think, that the president, and I, I don't know the context of, of how it uh, came up in his speech last night in New York, said that China must be a part of the new world order. guess I would like to ask you how you envision China fitting into the new world order. It is a country that uh, we are going to uh, uh, have relationships uh, with by virtue of its uh, geopolitical uh, importance. American officials say breaking down regional and national barriers to the flow of goods and services would represent a spectacular benefit to economies around the world. We are building a new world order. Bush would actually make a commencement address at Maxwell Air Force Base declaring the birth of this order. And that's why I wanted to speak to you today about the new world taking shape around us, about the prospects for a new world order now within our reach. In the coming weeks, I'll be talking in some detail about the possibility of a new world order emerging after the Cold War. But today, I want to discuss another aspect of that order. You see, as the Cold War drew to an end, we saw the possibilities of a new order in which nations work together it refers to new ways of working with other nations to deter aggression and to achieve stability. As old threats recede, new threats emerge. The quest for the new world order is in part a challenge to keep the dangers of disorder at bay. We must build on the successes of Desert Storm to give new shape and momentum to this new world order. Only when this transformation is complete will we be able to take full measure of the opportunities presented by this new and involving world order. The new world order really is a tool for addressing a new world of possibilities. This order gains its mission and shape not just from shared interests, but from shared ideals. After the Gulf War had ended, Bush was so obsessed with the idea of a new world order that he had a series of glocks imprinted with the term that he would give to members of his administration, including Colin Powell, Brent Scowcroft, Dick Cheney, and General Norman Schwarzkopf. Cheney would even approve policy papers regarding the New World Order. 
Defense Secretary Dick Cheney has approved a revised draft of a policy document on the new world order. The Pentagon is backing off a controversial earlier draft and has abandoned a one superpower strategy. The final document puts more emphasis on international alliances and organizations. This would become an unprecedented time period for people all over the globe to discuss at length what the new world order meant to them. People within the media. Does anybody want to talk about the new world order? Is there a new world order out there, or is this uh, a vision that's, that exists in the... He had, does have his vision, there's no doubt about that. But does that exist in the president's mind, or does it exist out there in reality? This president sees this episode as the first test case, as the first example for the new world order he is trying to organize. Some people have called it the new world disorder, and there's a lot of truth to that. University and institutional chairs. I mean, we're talking a new world order at Georgetown. <laughs> and we'd like to be very much a part of it and continue to live. This is a world that is likely to be dominated in the near future, and perhaps longer, by the Gulf War and the new world order, which is the buzzword of the moment. So the secret of a new world order, and at this point it's just a slogan, but it does have some historical background in terms that orders have succeeded each other over time. The secret of this is to learn how to use coalitions. We are effective in the United Nations. People within government. George Bush has invoked a new world order without enunciating a new American purpose. The president has still failed to articulate clear goals for our nation's foreign policy in this new age. I find the term New World Order very revolting, and uh, just not only historically, but uh, politically today. I think Harding is absolutely right, and the actions of the administration just after enunciation of the New World Order put the lie to the fact there is any real substance behind what they say as New World Order. The first act of the New World Order was A, to make war, and then B, was to sell arms all over again. Is there a New World Order? Uh, we know certainly that George Bush has uh, copyrighted the term at this point. In the aftermath of this war, though, is it an empty vessel into which uh, something will be poured? Is it the appropriate term to use? Is it going to be a new world order, or will disorder uh, be just as significant in this process as we look ahead? Uh, let's start with Madeline. I think that we have, in fact, kind of had this term thrown at us, and many of us have not liked it, uh, partially because of the previous historical connotation, and partially because I think it doesn't really deal with the way the world ought to be or is at the moment. But we are far from uh, seeing a world order, and I'm not sure that it is in best U.S. interest to have a new world order in which we are the policemen. While many began to become critical of this order, the term began to evaporate into the background. We are very, very skeptical of an international order if we are not sure how the rules will be made, because thus far, the international order has been made with rules that we had no input into and that affect us, and even when, in the few, on the few occasions when the rules will seem to favor us, then they get changed. A unipolar world, a world of one superpower, may be quite dangerous for us. A new world order under the United Nations would mean, among other things, an end to our God-given rights given us and secured by the Constitution. The new world order, which now has, uh, uh, has been called by some the new world disorder and, and by uh, some people on the more, of a more liberal persuasion, uh, the taking over of uh, uh, the world by the Council on Foreign Relations, the Trilateral Commission, and the UN to... Uh, put us all in slavery. But what are these organizations? Who founded them? And what are the stated goals of each? Before we begin with the Council on Foreign Relations, let's delve further into history to understand roundtable groups and their origins. Its roots go way, way back in history. And they go back to the formation of a secret society, a secret organization that was created by Cecil Rhodes, very powerful and very wealthy individual. And people have heard about him in history, and they know about the Rhodes Scholarship, 
And they think, well, it's not nice, but they don't understand at all what that's all about. Cecil Rhodes, when he died, left his great fortune not to his family, not to his heirs, but for the creation of a secret society. And we know about this because uh, there were some people very intimately involved with this organization who wrote about it. One of the best authors on this topic is Professor Carol Quigley. He wrote uh, several books, and um, Tragedy and Hope is the best known of his. He described in detail the secret organization created by Cecil Rhodes, and he explains in these books he knows about them because he was invited by the organization uh, into its... Uh, inner circle. He was never a member of it, but he was invited in as their historian, and he was allowed to see their secret records and papers and study them for several years. And he knew all the important players, and he understood what it was about, and so he wrote these books. And it's an amazing thing because he laid out in great detail what the purpose of the organization was and uh, how they were the major players in all of the, of the big international events since and including World War I. The bottom line is that you take the roots of that organization and you find out that they created in all of the British dependencies um, what they call round table groups. And uh, then around those little round table groups they created front groups. And the purpose of these front groups and round table groups was to penetrate into the governments of all of these different uh, countries to penetrate into the media centers, to penetrate into the educational systems. In other words, to penetrate into the social fabric, the power centers of society, and literally take them over from the inside without anybody being aware that they were controlling influence. After World War I, the International League of Nations arose as a precursor to the United Nations in 1919, under what seemed to be the vision of President Woodrow Wilson and his 14 points. The League of Nations was the first attempt at the New World Order, uh, the first attempt at a global government based on the model of collectivism. And it was the uh, brainchild of the elitists, the, the ancestors of the very people who are still working on this project. They're collectivists, the very wealthy people. They're the ones in this country who dominated the powerful tax-exempt foundations, like the Carnegie Endowment Fund for International Peace the Rockefeller funds, the Ford Foundation, and groups like that. These people were on record, even way back then, that they had to have a new world government, and they dreamed of that being embodied in the League of Nations. And they were solidly behind it. And that was one of the reasons those people encouraged the United States into World War I, was because of the crisis of World War I, and that would also condition Americans to thinking of making big changes in their system, because we certainly don't want another war like that, do we? There's that fear angle again. And they thought, well, by being in World War I, then we would be a major participant at the table to carve up the world and create a new world government. And that was to be the League of Nations. Well, what happened to it is that the American people didn't really go for it. Wilson was aware of the elite and their control over society. In his book, The New Freedom, published in 1913, he discussed such a group. Since I entered politics, I have chiefly had men's views confided to me privately. Some of the biggest men in the United States, in the field of commerce and manufacture, are afraid of something. They know that there is a power somewhere so organized, so subtle, so watchful, so interlocked, so complete, so pervasive, that they better not speak above their breath when they speak in condemnation of it. Ultimately, this insight did not spare him from becoming yet another puppet of the global elite. 